Charles Buddy Romer was born in Shreveport and raised on a cotton and cattle farm in North Louisiana. After completing his MBA from Harvard, Buddy returned home to start his own business ventures. In 1973, he served as a delegate to the Louisiana Constitutional Convention. He was elected to the U.S. Congress in 1980 as a conservative Democrat. I first had the opportunity of knowing Buddy Romer when I came to the House of Representatives back in 1982. He was already a legend for his wit, his humor, his intellect, his talent, and his incredible legislative accomplishments. He was, interestingly, the first member of Congress to introduce legislation that called for sanctions on South Africa uh, until the end of apartheid. He wanted to serve the people, and he had, a, he had a social conscience. So you mix all that together with uh, the brains, and that's a formidable combination. Defying long odds, Buddy ran for governor in 1987 and led his Romer revolution all the way to the governor's mansion. We had more problems than you could shake a stick at. We had uh, a bankrupt state. We had one that had not dealt with issues having to do with the environment, having to do with uh, uh, education, having to do with ethics, having to do with economic development. And in the first 100 days uh, of his administration, more things were done, more things were passed on a broader spectrum than any governor before or since. As governor, he pushed through increased teacher pay and strengthened the Department of Environmental Quality. We had more pollution, toxic pollution, as EPA measures it, than any other state. Over the four years we were in office, we cut it in half. That's never been done in the United States before. Governor Romer was also able to toughen campaign finance laws. I think that's had a drastic impact. I think that was the precursor to all the ethics movement we've had in the state in the past 25 years. Buddy is a visionary. He has a vision of what Louisiana ought to be. He's got the brains to carry it out and the courage to do so. Though he began his governorship in 1988 as a Democrat, he left it in 1992 as a Republican. Back in private life, he's turned his attention to international trade, banking, and real estate and retirement community development. Governor Romer also donates his time and energy to charitable causes, including medical missions to South America with his wife Scarlett, who's a registered nurse. He absolutely thought, uh, I'm here on this earth to make a difference. And he put himself in the positions where he could make that difference. Governor Buddy Romer, moving Louisiana forward for more than three decades as public servant and private citizen. Governor Buddy Romer. Thank you very much. I, I knew I might get emotional, so I wrote it out right quick. I want to thank LPB and Beth Courtney, its leader, for including me as a small part of such a wonderful group of honorees. Willis, James, Lewis, Marjorie, wow. Louisiana is an awesome place of hope and hard work and family and creativity and honor and sacrifice and happiness and love. There are many, many good and great places on earth, but I don't know where roots grow better than right here in Louisiana. Everywhere that Scarlett and I go in the world, someone always stops me and they say, didn't you used to be Buddy Romer? <laughs> I say, yep, but not anymore. And immediately, New York, Belgium, wherever we are, immediately they start talking about Louisiana, how much they miss it, how they're coming back someday as soon as they can find the kind of work that they do how the promise that lured them away proved to be short-term, somehow smaller than they had hoped, and that they were at their happiest in Louisiana. Louisiana is the legend, not me. I was just lucky enough to be born here. I discovered when I ran for governor the first time that uh, Louisiana was actually three states. <laughs> Tough to be governor of one, impossible to be governor of three. 
I mean, I was just, I used to be Willis's size. Uh, it's North Louisiana, South Louisiana, and New Orleans, and I'm, I'm part of that tribal thing. I mean, I, I counted that there are three North Louisiana boys here today out of the five, so there you go. My grandfather, Pete Romer, many of you knew he lived on Bourbon Street in New Orleans. He had a little company uh, called Walker Romer Milk. He had the cow on the interstate, remember? That was granddad, he's dead now. His only son, Charles Romer II, my father, and we lived in North Louisiana. So growing up with my granddad in New Orleans and my dad in North Louisiana, I knew there were differences between North and South. But until you run for governor, you have no idea how deep the tribal instincts run. <laughs> I'm running for governor as a young congressman from North Louisiana. You know, I'm 30-something, and I'm, man, we can do this. I had no chance, but I didn't know that. And I'm giving a speech outdoors in one of the high school stadium in, in Shreveport, and a huge crowd had come out to see me, and they were getting into it. You know, I was, I was talking against the good old boy network, which I hate, and all those things. I was hammering on, and the crowd was into it. And finally, some guy jumped up and said, I'm with you, buddy. We're going to win. I'm with you. We're going to take over the Capitol. Austin, here we come. I said, no. <laughs> Frank. Frank. It's Baton Rouge, man. He said, all right. Over my time on earth as a businessman, then a politician, and now as a businessman again, I realized that the world has become smaller and more competitive, more challenging, and that the only way we can win as a state, now listen to me, is to be one state. The only way we'll bring our kids home again is to unite, build a team, and form not three states, but one. Working together for opportunity, for reunion, for a common good. Keep our regional uniqueness. I like that. But after the debate and the festivals are over, let's form one team, one state, one purpose. Leadership is too precious, great talent too rare, resources too limited, competition is too dedicated, every child is too valuable for us to dilute our future by trying to cover three states rather than one. Tonight, I especially thank LPB, a living example over time of pulling a state together. Fewer than a hundred men and women communicate throughout our state. They bring great teachers to every nook and cranny. They cover all social and political and cultural events. We would be a lesser place without it. Let me close by thanking those who, uh, who got me here. I am them. And I thank them particularly my mother and father, Adeline and Budgie Romer. They're still alive and they're living up at Scopina Plantation, 10 miles outside of Bossier City on a cotton and cattle farm. They're 87, 86, and fragile in health, or they would have been here tonight. Growing up on that farm in the 50s with three sisters, Margaret, Melinda, Melanie, and a brother, Danny. And with horses and dogs and cattle and homeschooling in the summers and hard work and baseball, I love baseball, and books and hard work and no television, Beth, and hard work. <laughs> it was a magical time beyond your ability to understand. We debated the threat and promise of Sputnik at the dinner table at night. We heard John Kennedy in 1956 running for president on the radio at the Democratic Convention. He lost, but we knew he was our man. We talked our way through the 50s, the whole family seated at the supper table, discussing evolution and Republicans 
and Democrats and education and America. It was a time of great tension in the South, with civil unrest stirring as segregation strutted across our land. The courage of my father, who refused to be one of the racists, he said openly that he thought it, he thought it was a crime for the government to enforce prejudice rather than fight it. Most people in our community treated dad with respect, but he was spat on, had fist fights, and a cross burned in our front yard more than once. He would not back down. He taught us to be conservative in our money affairs and to be liberal in our opportunities with people. Mom gave us love and the gift of reading long before we went to a classroom. It's a gift that I use every day. So, everything I am, I owe to mom and dad. And on behalf of Margaret and Melinda and Melanie and Danny, I say thank you to them. And finally, to my beautiful wife, Scarlett, and my kids, Caroline and her husband, John, and my grandson, Owen, Chaz, and his wife, Tina, and my two grandchildren, named after my mother and father, Adeline II and Charles V. And to my last child, the infamous Dakota Frost Romer. I say thank you for giving me reason to hope and work and to stay in the fight for a better state, a better country, and a better world. That fight is for you. And I'm so proud of each and every one of you. I want to give particular thanks to Scarlett for her marriage to me. Uh, my kids and grandkids did not have a choice. <laughs> Scarlett was a volunteer. I'd been married twice before to two really good women. Cookie at the age of 19 for 10 years with two children, Caroline and Chaz, and Patty at the age of 30 for 15 years, and one child, Dakota. Both Cookie and Patty are doing well and remain friends of mine and remain members of our extended family, and I want to thank them for all they've meant to me. I often wonder what happened to those marriages. But Scarlett reminds me that the only common thing about both marriages was me. She says that might be a clue. <laughs> Scarlett's got two degrees from LSU as a nurse and a piano player. And she made a decision that helped me live my life. Thank you, honey. A legend? I don't think so, but lucky you bet. Thanks. Our 2010 Louisiana Legends. Hello, I'm Beth Courtney. Welcome to Louisiana Legends. Charles E. Buddy Romer, reformer, intellectual, maverick, traits that cut both ways during his political life, endearing him to disaffected voters and alienating many politicians whose cooperation he needed for his reform agenda. Romer's love of books and the world of ideas should make this a lively conversation. And welcome, Governor Romer. Thank you, Beth. It's always good to be with you, Beth. It is terrific being with you. You know, I've known you a long time. You grew up uh, in North Louisiana, in Bossier Parish, and Scapina Plantation. Uh, what was it like growing up there as a young boy? It was unbelievable. It, it was like a different time. Now, I know I'm old enough now. I'm 66. Uh, to, to it was another time. But psychologically, it was uh, the 50s. It was a farm. Uh, I had f a brother and three sisters. There were five kids. We worked. We literally worked every day. Before school, we fed animals. When we came home after school, we went to public school in Bossier City, about 10 miles away. When we got home in the afternoon, we worked till nightfall with our horses, with our cattle, with our crops. My father just believed 
in the power of hard work. And we grew up that way. Now people say I'm a workaholic. I wonder where I get that from. <laughs> I mean, you grew up on a farm. It was on, I, it helped me though, because I decided at an early age that I didn't have what it took to be a great farmer. I didn't have seven days, 14 hours a day in me. I didn't, I couldn't be dependent on whether it would rain or not. I couldn't be dependent on the temperature in August and September. But I learned so much. I grew up with a family that was close. My mother and father are still married. After all these years, they still live in the same house on the same farm. So I get back to Shreveport and Bossier every week or two weeks at the longest. And it's like going home again. Your first elected position, I think, correct, at Constitutional, Constitutional Convention. was. 19, I was elected in 1972 and served in 73 and the first part of 74, when under Edwards' leadership, we brought that to a vote of the people and passed it. I was a, I was a non-lawyer, right. which I still proudly am, and was, was one of the few non-lawyers in that constitutional convention, but brought that kind of practical sense, I hope, to the revenue department, where that was the committee I worked on under the leadership of 60 BB60 Raper. Ooh, remember him chairman. well. I was yeah. the vice chairman, he was the chair. He, he was the smart one, I was the gopher. <laughs> but he was the one who uh, was a, said he was a pipe fitter. Proudly, it had only gone, I think, to elementary, middle school, and here you were at the Harvard MBA, but he gave you a lesson oh, in he politics. Oh, he was wonderful. I, <laughs> still, I still, to this day, mm -hmm. have good memories of, sick, of BB60 Raper. Good man. Well, you must have had a good experience because you decided to run for Congress after that. Now, you weren't that successful early. I lost. I, yeah. I have lost about as many races as I've won, but I'm very energetic. I mean, I, <laughs> I, am, I, I don't worry about the winning and losing. I worry about the statement of what I believe and how it might change the world for a better place. And in that race, there were like 11 or 12 or 15 people running for Congress. Joe Wagner had been a good congressman for years up there and decided unexpectedly not to run for reelection. And so a group of us wannabes all signed up. Most of them were members of the legislature already. Mm -hmm. I won't try to name everybody's name, but you would know them. Uh, and I was one of the few who was a non-elected official. And, and was really making my inaugural run mm -hmm. across parish lines uh, to take me for Congress. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was during that election where I was leading in that election with about two weeks to go, 10 days to go. And I said that in order to balance the budget, I would take the big project in North Louisiana, the Red the River, Red River Navigation, I that, yeah. and I would give it back to the federal government and ask every congressman to do the same, and the budget would be balanced in a week. Interest rates would fall, and people would go back to work again. I thought it was a great idea, but the other politicians, Joe Wagner, poor Joe, he's dead now, <laughs> and he and I laughed about it for years. He jumped on me, said, vote for anybody but Romer. But I mean, you know, so anyway, <laughs> so, I, I so, lost my so first So you lost race. your first, but then you were successful. On the same um, issue, on the I same, might say. That's right. Two years later, mm -hmm. you know, Congress is every two years. Mm -hmm. So don't You're worry about running, running for Congress. You're always <laughs> running for Congress. And I ran, and Buddy Leach had won that first race. He and Jimmy Wilson right. had beaten me. I finished third. And then the second time we ran... I finished second to Buddy Leach, and then he and I ran it off, and I beat him in a runoff. I was lucky. Well, you know, it's an interesting thing that uh, successful there, a different body than being, say, governor of the state, which yeah. is where the next thing you tackled, uh, a deliberative yeah. body, seems to be your background would be very supportive of that, having debated ideas at yeah. the dinner table. Uh, you do get to debate the important issues. You really learn about issues. You don't, it's not just... It's not just skimming the surface. You don't have 500 votes in a week. You, you, you have 500 votes on the same issue mm -hmm. in the course of one year, two years, or three years. Plus, all the work's indoors. If something goes <laughs> wrong, you can blame the president. What a great job. I, love, I never had anybody run against me. In my, after I won, I lost, then I won, and then two years later, no one ran against me. Two years later, no one ran against me. 
Two years later, no one ran against me. I was the only member of Congress that had three consecutive elections where no one ran against him in his party or any other party, which means that I was in touch with the people. I really got into that job. I liked it. It was a good job. Well, well you decide, though, to run for governor. Yeah. 1987. <laughs> a big field. I remember that race well. It was a big well. Good field. Good field. I mean, they were... Uh, uh, Jim Brown, who was Secretary of State, Edwin Edwards, who was the most popular and successful governor we maybe ever had, certainly in my lifetime. Uh, we had Billy Tozan, who was a successful member of Congress. We had Bob Livingston from the Republican Party, who was a very successful member of Congress and was almost going to be Speaker of the House a few years later mm -hmm. after he mm -hmm. lost that right. election. So it was an election that I was not expected to win. I was lucky to win this election. Let me just tell you. I mean, I think we ran a good campaign, and I give uh, Steve Cochran and Lynn Sanderson and and uh, Mark McKinnon, names that have become famous across America in election. I mean, Mark McKinnon got George Bush elected twice. Uh, uh, I, I had all kinds of young people work in this election, and their efforts were wonderful. I, I was a good candidate, though, because I think because I was unafraid of losing. I had lost before. Edwards used to always tell me when we would visit how he had never lost an election. Right. And that becomes, it's like a baseball, it's like LSU winning 25 in a row, and all of a sudden mm -hmm. it becomes a burden to them, you know? Mm -hmm. I didn't never have Never making a B. Yes, never <laughs> right. making a B. Right. I didn't have that burden. I had lost my first time out in a serious race, and I survived. I smiled the next morning, I cried, I laughed, I paid off my debts. So I ran unafraid of losing. My fear was, that Edwards would win again. That was my fear. And I said that. Slay the dragon. Slay the dragon. If it's a Republican versus Edwards in the runoff, I'm with the Republican. I don't have to check with anybody. It's real easy. Remember, I was a Democrat then. And oh, everybody went, how can Buddy say that? Well, let me tell you why I said that. I thought that the state... Well, it was a Roma revolution, too. It a was. nice alliteration, and that's what you... That, that, there was a <laughs> phrase somebody came up with. But here's what the revolution was that it wasn't about me. It was about us. It was about living in a state that was better than its reputation. It was about living in a state, Beth, where the best and the brightest of our citizens were moving to Los Angeles or to San Francisco or to Washington or to New York. And it's not right. And, and, and I wanted the governor to stand up and say that, and I couldn't get Edwards to do it. So I said, by golly, I'm going to do it. And he and everybody laughed for about a year. What are the things you're proudest of? Uh, your environmental record is certainly I'm terrific. real proud of that because yeah. it was such a contrast to what I inherited. Right. I think we've always been hunters and fishermen and women. And I think we've always taken care of our camp and our boat. But we never collectively took care of our state. We had the... Dave Treen gets all the credit. Let me give it to him. He started the Department of Environment. Right. There was a Republican, no government kind of guy. He started a new department. He ought to get credit for that. What we get credit for is that we funded it for the first time. We levied fines, we collected tax money, and we invested it in clean air and clean water. We got the Environmental Award from the Sierra Club four years in right. a row as a state. The only state in America ever to get that. That's how far we came. We started the oil field reservoir cleanup. We started coastal erosion, trust fund, highway trust fund. I mean, just kind of run it like a business. I'm real proud of that. Well, tough times, though, because Edwin Edwards was sitting out there sort of second-guessing you a little bit as well. A lot. Yeah, a lot. That was, that was what he was supposed to do. I mean, I don't have any problem with Edwin Edwards. I mean, he's a good politician, and he took what openings I gave him. Right. He didn't have any on his own because he didn't have a record, but, but he's a very gifted politician. And he could make fun of when I fell short, and I did often. He could make fun of how difficult it was for me to pass things through the legislature. And it, take, it would take me three or four times to pass something because he was in the back just right. pulling votes off of me. 
He had the, the African-American, uh, historically called the black vote, was really married to him, and I don't understand why, but that was true. He, he'd get about 33% of the vote. That was the, the black vote. And then, and then he helped mastermind. Here's what beat me. I could beat Edwin Head up. I, I say that modestly. He had that 33 35%, but he didn't have any more than that. But I didn't have that much when David Duke got in the race. David Duke took my good friends up north, where you and I are from, right. got a little redneck showing, and he impressed them. Well, Romer's not conservative enough. He's in the government. We ought to throw all the rascals out. He was very good, David Duke. I mean, he's, I think he's an evil guy. I think his thoughts about putting down Jews and Catholics and women and people who I think they're, they're terrible. Well, but he was a very effective politician, and he carved off about a third of the vote. Edwin carved off about a third of the vote, and I was left with the remaining 28 or 29 percent. came in third. I came in third. And, really a bad and, third. I was, I was three or four points behind these guys. Well, and so it set up, you know, just an incredibly difficult time where people were saying, vote for the crook, it's that important. I, I endorsed mean, Edwards. And you endorsed Edwards. I didn't Edwards. call him a crook then. Well, and I don't there was like a bumper to, sticker. That's right, it was a bumper <clears throat> sticker. But, but I thought compared to Duke, it was easy. It was an easy vote. So you've had a few attempts to come back and different thinking about different races. Yes. But you've fa found some success now in, in being a businessman, being a banker, back to your financial roots, if you will. You like it, don't you? First thing before I did that, I accepted a position at Harvard called right. the Kennedy Fellow. Right. And... Uh, it, it, it was good for me to kind of leave the state for a while and, and, and be with young, my, my son was a senior at Harvard, and uh, uh, that was good for me. Then I came home and I began to build banks. I got with a guy named Joe Tragel, a local businessman here, and Joe and I formed a company called the Sterling Group. We did, we, we traded uh, uh, with chemical companies throughout the world, getting their goods and supplies. Joe was very good at that. I could open the doors. We had a very successful business. But then I decided with Milton Womack, a local mm -hmm. businessman, Rolf McAllister, mm -hmm. and a few others, John Inquist, and a few others, to form called the Business Bank, a new concept in banking. Uh, we got Pete Boone, who's athletic director at Ole Miss, to come be our first bank president. Pete wanted to resign after a couple of years. That was his agreement, and I took his place. We built that into a very successful bank. We sold that to Bank Corp South. Then after a year, which I promised I would give them a year, we started over again, and we have uh, Business First Bank. We're in, we're in Shreveport, Baton Rouge, Lafayette, Lake Charles, Mandeville, and now new in Homa Thibodeau. So we cover the state now, and we are a fast, high-tech business bank working with small and medium-sized businesses. We're about $650 million. That's a pretty good-sized bank, particularly in four years. We're four years old. But I like banking. I was on the banking committee of the Congress. I'm a trained banker and businessman from Harvard, if you forgive that, but that was my training. Uh, I knew I was going to get in business someday, and the people of Louisiana insisted that I quit politics <laughs> and get in business, and I said, okay, watch this, <laughs> watch. and we've been very lucky. You know, you still have tremendous energy. We're always impressed by that, just all, always going, you know, I see you now, at, we're grandparents at various sporting events. You have yeah. three grandchildren? I, I, three. I have three children, Caroline, uh, Chaz and, and Dakota. Dakota, and I have three grandchildren. grandchildren. Owen is the youngest at almost two. Uh, Adeline is nine, and Charles is seven, and they are wonderful grandkids. It's also rather nice to be married to a lovely trained nurse pianist, a be your beautiful wife, Scarlett. I'm nearly as dumb as I look. <laughs> uh, I, I, I had a divorce when I was governor. It was so painful, Beth. I cannot tell you how it just broke me apart. But, but I decided to live, okay? And I stayed unmarried for 10 years, 12 years, however long it was. And then at the age of 58, I got married to a younger woman who is a piano player, an LSU graduate, a registered nurse, and she, her name is Scarlett. 
She grew up in Shreveport until she was the age of two or three, then moved to Jackson, Mississippi. So she calls herself a Mississippian. But she's the best thing that ever happened to me. Governor, thank you for being with us in Louisiana. Legends, you are truly a legend. Thanks. Thanks, Beth.